On behalf of Rutgers Business School, I'd like to welcome you to our virtual conference on behavioral finance. I'm John Longo, Professor of Finance and Economics here at Rutgers and co-organizer of the conference with my colleague, Ron Richter. We're gratified by the turnout. More than 1,400 people have registered for the conference. We're excited to have a lineup of world-class speakers headed, of course, by Nobel laureate Richard Thaler. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Rutgers Business School, especially Professor Ivan Brick and Dean Lay, NextGen Financial, Wiley, and the Financial Planning Association of New Jersey. Assuming the role of president of a large research university during a time of unprecedented challenges and a global pandemic requires an exceptional leader with courage, integrity, and strength. Rutgers is fortunate to have President Jonathan Holloway leading us at this time. Jonathan Holloway graduated with honors from Stanford University as an undergraduate, and then from Yale with a doctorate degree in history. He's an accomplished scholar and eminent historian, as well as a visionary academic leader. He served as the Dean of Yale College for several years, and more recently as the Provost at Northwestern. He's also an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So welcome President Holloway and thanks so much for joining us at this conference. Thanks for that introduction, John and Dean Lay. Um, my name is Jonathan Holloway. I'm the president of Rutgers University. I'm happy to join this conference and thank all of you for participating with us and for bearing with everybody. Um, we all need a measure of grace during this moment and during this really nationwide storm we're navigating. It's my great privilege to introduce our featured speaker. More than that, I have the honor of welcome him, welcoming him home in a manner of speaking to New Jersey, at least virtually. Professor Richard Thaler was born in East Orange and raised in Chatham, and both his father and uncle worked for Prudential for many years. Suffice it to say that he knows more about the pork roll versus Taylor ham debate, and which side of that debate has it right, than a newcomer like me does. Personally, I try to stay away from it. Dr. Thaler won the, ninth, the, excuse me, the 2017 Nobel Prize in Economics for, as he put it, discovering human life in a place where my fellow economists thought it did not exist in the economy. He dared to ask, what if we assume that people are not rational or selfish, that they don't always have a lot of self-control in their decisions, that they act more like Homer Simpson than like Mr. Spock? In 2008, he co-authored a best-selling uh, book called Nudge, which posits that we can put the concepts of behavioral economics to work in helping people make decisions that are in their best interests by making it easy to do so. This concept has been applied in both the public and private sectors in many ways, from improving energy efficiency to helping employees save more for retirement to in increasing participation in organ donation. Six years ago, Professor Thaler published another book, Misbehaving, The Making of Behavioral Economics. He's authored or edited four other books and has published numerous articles in prominent economic and finance journals. Professor Thaler holds a PhD from the University of Rochester where he began his academic career. Since 1995, he's been on the faculty of the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago after more than a decade and a half at Cornell. He's been elected to some of our nation's most prestigious academic organizations, including the National Academy of Science and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as the American Economic Association, which he served as president. He's also the founder and principal at Fuller and Thaler Asset Management based in California. We are excited to have this Nobel laureate with us and look forward to his insights. To interview him, we are happy to welcome Ty Moore Hyatt. Mr. Hyatt is Chief Operating Officer of Prudential Global Investment Management, or PGIM, with oversight for everything from strategy to thematic research to operations and communications. He also oversees the group that provides portfolio level advice to institutional clients around the world. Mr. Hyatt has previously worked at Credit Suisse, Lehman Brothers, and McKinsey and & Company, and holds a doctor in economics from Oxford University. We are happy to have them both take part in today's virtual conference. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you. Richard, I, I know we, uh, we have a little time and a, and a lot to cover. So, so uh, maybe I'll start with a question that brings us back to the, to the link to, uh, to Newark. Uh, I'm from PGM, which is the asset management business of Prudential Financial. Um, like Rutgers, we have deep roots in Newark. 
Uh, I know you spoke eloquently in your Nobel biography speech about your father working at Prudential, how the actuarial data he, he accessed uh, in a little thin red book kind of helped with some of your research. Um, let me ask you a broad opening question, which is what are some of the interesting problems that life insurers uh, you think might get involved in to solve? Sure, well, uh, thanks for having me. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be back in New Jersey, um, especially talking to you right now from Oakland. Um, I, I think, you know, I've spent a lot of time over my career helping solve the problem of um, helping people save for retirement and uh, making uh, defined contribution saving plans more robust. I think the big next big frontier is helping people with the back end of that problem, uh, namely retirement income solutions. And right now we help them save and they have with luck, a, uh, a pot of money, maybe a big pot of money. And then uh, we say, bye, best of luck. Um, now, obviously there's a role there for annuities, which is a traditional role for insurance companies, but there's a peculiar, uh, what we've called the annuity puzzle, which is that people who have annuities love them but people who have pots of money never buy them. And uh, I, I went through an interesting experience. The uh, uh, Chicago Symphony Orchestra had a strike about a year ago. And um, the, the strike was about the management wanted to replace their old DB plan with a DC plan. And it was a really generous, alternative and uh, the strike was going on for weeks somehow i got involved in this i'm not sure how and my role ended up being explaining to two or three members of the orchestra that if it were me i would take the new deal over the old one and i thought it was better and they were striking against their best interest in in my opinion and uh, so why, why people love an annuity if they have it, but wouldn't, wouldn't, would go on strike to prevent themselves from getting it, I don't know. And um, uh, that's, that's an interesting problem. Uh, it, it's, insurance companies could help solve. It's, it's, it's one we grapple, and we grapple it these days as we think about retirement income solutions and decumulation, Richard, virtually and of course the reason is what you know this, this great global lockdown or quasi lockdown uh, certainly in in the us and, and europe and i know you've you've spoken a lot about kind of what are some of the innovative ideas and how the us and the world might handle uh, vaccine hesitancy what are some of the bottlenecks uh, you proposed some of these ideas in in early on in the in the vaccine phase in late last year i read them uh, we're now in february it's been a couple more months uh, what what nudges, what additional nudges would you either give policymakers or suggest policymakers give us and vaccine users? Well, uh, you know, I think the biggest problem right now is on, on rollout and um, just getting the shots to as many of people as possible as quickly as possible. Uh, and but that gives us a couple months uh maybe longer but we hope not um anyway a few months to think about what are we going to do during the next phase which is when we are trying to get people to agree to be vaccinated now people are clamoring to get a shot and at some point we're going to have this switch over and one of the things I suggested in that New York Times piece you referred to was that we dangle a, a benefit. Um, we might call it a health passport. Um, so uh, give people some electronic version of a vaccine certification 
that they could use to get on airplanes and to um, maybe go to a baseball game or get into a bar. Right now, what we're offering, I actually got my second shot yesterday. I can exactly. show you what, what they're giving. It's a piece of paper. This is the 21st tech century technology. It's a piece of paper that doesn't fit in your wallet that has been handwritten. It's ridiculous. So uh, I think we can upgrade that. I think internationally we'll be forced to. And uh, I'm hoping that people in the Biden administration are hard at work at that and they're just not telling us. We wouldn't want to roll it out right now because it would just get people even madder that they can't get a shot. But I think um, we should have that technology available, say, by early summer so that we can say, look, you, you, you want to you go to the Yankees game? You're going to have to show your ID. And um, I think that would help. It, it, it sounds like the optimal nudge. Um, to some extent, I think this sort of zoonotic pandemics of which COVID-19 is one uh, are an example of, of tail risks or nonlinear risks that are, that are harder for, for humans perhaps to understand and build policy against. Uh, I know maybe another example of a slow burning crisis has been and one that the Biden administration, uh, Richard has clearly made a sort of top priority is combating climate change. Uh, the space has become, in, in our view, somewhat unnecessarily highly politicized. Uh, but ultimately, some kind of regulation, hopefully sensible regulation, will be, will be key in, in combating climate change in the US and, and around the world. And, and my question to you was, you know, are there any nudges, again, that you think or advice you'd give that could sort of move the needle on, on climate change uh, in the US? Well, um... My uh, co-author, Cass Sunstein, and I have been, our, our, our COVID-19 project was, we've uh, written a completely new version of Nudge. And uh, in fact, I have the last bit of the copy edit to do as my task for this afternoon. And we have a, an entire chapter on climate change. And the, the thing we emphasize is we're not going to solve that problem with budget. Uh, it's too big of a problem. And I, I have my real economist hat on in this chapter. And we say you have to get the prices right. And so uh, I, I join 90% of maybe 99% of all economists in thinking that we need something like a carbon tax or cap and trade. Uh, where we gradually ramp up the price of carbon to something some uh, something like the social cost of carbon, which would be certainly over a hundred dollars a ton. And uh, that will give everybody the right incentives. And uh, if we don't do that, I think we do. Now there are, things we can do to supplement. And what, one thing you can do, so once you get the prices right, the other thing you can do is make the high price saline. So, um, you, you know, there, here's an, an analog. Uh, uh, withholding taxes make taxes less painful. Because most people think of their income tax bill as negative because when they file their taxes, they get a refund. Something like 80, 90% of Americans get refunds. Um, uh, three, four thousand dollars. So uh, Ronald Reagan, when he was governor of California, tried to get rid of the withholding tax for state income tax because he wanted small government and he wanted the tax to hurt. And the, the Democratic legislature said, no way you're getting this. And uh, I, I'm not sure I would, uh, I would welcome that. But the, there is an idea there. And uh, people you know, are, 
are, uh, gasoline prices are right in your face. When gasoline prices go up and people, it cost them $100 to fill up their car, that's in, in their face. Uh, when you turn the thermostat down a couple degrees on a hot day or up a couple degrees, uh, if you're in the Northeast today, um, no bells are ringing. And you could literally have bells ringing uh, it, when you're burning a lot of um, ex expensive uh, fuel. And so there are things like that, but here, and we got to start with getting the price to it, it just struck me, we just released a report last week uh, called Weathering Climate Change at PGM, where one whole chapter is devoted to when will this be reflected in asset classes and security prices? And uh, what will be that Minsky moment or gradual sort of internalization of climate change externalities? And, and one other thing that struck us uh, looking at climate change was a lot of the focus is on climate risk, but there are also opportunities on the path to to, to climate change and, uh, and greening the, the world. Uh, but speaking of investment implications, uh, I, I know you're also the founding partner of a highly successful asset manager, uh, you know, bringing active uh, asset management and generating alpha. Uh, I, I, I guess, uh, what are your takeaways from the recent uh, GameStop uh, rally and then collapse by retail investors on Reddit uh, and more broadly, with all the data out there, Richard, what do you see as still some of the most uh, sort of existing biases that still exist that are relevant to generating alpha for investment managers like, like your firm and, and ours? Well, I, I must say that um, for those of us who are old enough to be, have been around in the late 90s, there's a, a lot of deja vu uh, and um, there are similarities and differences. The similarities are that there are a lot of companies with terrible balance sheets that are selling for remarkably high prices. Now, it, it's not the case, you know, the, the market has been led up by the so-called FAMANG stocks. Um, and those are different than the tech leaders in the late 90s because they're making a lot of money. Apple and Google uh, are making money. Um, but uh, GameStop was, was not. And um, if you look at the Russell 2000, which is the territory that uh, we mostly invest in at Fuller and Thaler, the number of companies that have negative earnings uh, is remarkably high and their, their prices are remarkably high and they're going up. And uh, it's, a, it's a funny time to be an asset manager uh, like the 1990s, um, the, the companies with profits seem to be being punished. Um, I, you know, long term, I'm kind of an old fashioned guy and I think uh, the market likes profits. And um, I, I anticipate some kind of shakeup when we, you know, value has been doing terribly. Quality has been doing terribly, two factors. Um, typically when, when those periods end, they rebound very strongly, but no one has any ability to say when that's gonna happen. Uh, any more than we had an ability to say when game, GameStop would start going up and start going down or, or whether $50 a share is now uh, intrinsic value or what's gonna happen next. Um, believe me, I have no, I have no money rested on, on, on that because I don't have any ability to predict it. And uh, I think 
it helps to be a long-term investor in these situations, but you got to have patience. And uh, if you're in our business, you need patient investors, uh, which at least for now, our, uh, our investors have remained patient. Long-termism is key. I, I guess maybe a related question is, we see other bubbles as well. We talked about GameStop, but then you see kind of all the talk about SPACs, cryptocurrency. There's just a Silicon Valley billionaire, I think, who made a big investment through his company in, 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 in cryptocurrencies. Um, when you see all these bubbles, uh, Richard, at the same time, you've seen probably the deepest recession since, since World War II, and I know we're coming out of it a little bit now. How do you square? Is this just humans are kind of bored at home and bubbles build up when you have lots of time day trading or kind of what's driving these bubbles in the midst of a recession? How, how do you kind of think about it? Yeah, I, I think it is. A, I, certainly, I think retail investors, the, the big rise in retail investors, the only explanation I have for it is boredom. So I was bored and got trapped into rewriting a book. Um, and uh, other people have been using their time uh, more profitably, perhaps, uh, or, or maybe not. Uh, you know, especially in the early days, there weren't even sporting events to bet on. So you had people trapped at home, and uh, some of them started investing and you know if they're investing uh, a few hundred or a few thousand dollars uh, long only, no leverage, um, you know, God bless them, and um, it, uh, it's uh, no more harmful than binging some Netflix series. Um, but it, you know, when you read about people borrowing money to plunk it all down on one of these meme stocks, that's a bit more worrying. And I think that, so my prediction is that retail investing, buying individual companies will go back out of fashion. I mean, it, it was big in the 1990s and then it kind of disappeared. Um, and my guess is that that will happen again, but um, I wouldn't make any investments based on, on that guess. But it's still a bold prediction that the Rutgers Behavioral Finance Conference heard first. Uh, we've talked a lot about investing and investments, uh, and that's clearly a passion you, you and I share, but uh, I know there's a big group of behavioral scientists and, uh, and students of, of that discipline uh, uh, in the audience today. Um, supposing a, a promising PhD student walked into, I, I guess now your virtual office, uh, uh, Dr. Taylor, and uh, you wanted to, wanted to ask you what would be kind of some of the ideal research ideas that they should investigate. Uh, that doesn't come from the academic literature, but, but like you've always said, in, uh, comes from real, real life, real problems in real lives. What, what would be some of the most interesting issues or problems you'd say to them is a research agenda for the next five, seven years? Yeah, I, I must say that I, I'm very reluctant to uh, give that kind of advice. Uh, the, the advice you're referring to that I, I often use the line, make your research about the world and not about the literature. And uh, I'm always encouraging my students to spend less time reading and more time thinking. And so I, I think I would be encouraging them to think about problems that aren't, there, that there aren't a hundred papers already written on. And, you know, I, I, I would certainly discourage a student from writing another paper about GameStop. Um, you, 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 you don't want to be in a race. Um, it, it happened to me once that I was working on a paper where there were like 10 other teams 
working on the same paper. <laughs> Oddly enough, it was a paper about game shows. So we had access to the uh, data from a deal or no deal mm -hmm. and uh, ended up writing a paper about that. And lots of economists had the same idea. And uh, that was an unpleasant uh, situation. But all, all the rest of the time, I was working on problems that everybody else thought was too wacky to go into. So I, I would just be encouraging students to find things they find fascinating. And then the kind of ad advice I give them is they'll, they'll come up with some narrow question and I'll say, okay, how can we make this bigger? So, you know, if you were going to write a paper about GameStop, well, GameStop in the grand scheme of things is not very interesting. And a, a paper about retail investing and when, when people go into individual stock picking as opposed to uh, in, investing in mutual funds, what produces that, that, you know, that's starting to get interesting. And, um, you know, again, back where we started at the beginning, uh, thinking about how to help people make better retirement income solutions. I think there's, uh, there's a lot of potential there. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I've never given a PhD student a, a thesis topic. I think framing the class of issues sounds like a sounds like a great way to inspire them. Maybe if we have time for one final question sure. uh, uh, on a on a sort of more nostalgic note, uh, describe to the audience what it what you know was it four in the morning, four in the evening? How was the experience of being told that you were uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics? Uh, how did it play out? Well, yeah, it was it was at four in the morning. Uh, Chicago time, and you know it's impossible not to know what day it is. Although Paul Paul Milgram appears to have forgotten this year, but uh, the reason why it's impossible to know it, not to know is economics is the last prize. So the entire previous week, each day. There's been announcements about um, physics and medicine, and all the all the real ones. Um, and then your so-called friends, oh, uh, economics is always on the Monday of the second week. Your so-called friends are sending you emails saying, "Oh, uh, we, this is going to be your year," and this may explain why Paul Milgram had turned his phone off. But the, the only concession I ever made to that was to turn the ring around my cell phone. But otherwise, I slept very soundly every one of those every one of those nights. Um, and then uh, we still have a landline in our Chicago apartment, and the landline ran. The landline phone is on my wife's side of the bed. She heard it, picked up the headset, and the headset battery was dead because we don't ever use the landline. And she's trying to answer the phone, and it's dead, and she's trying to wake me up, and I'm just out. So she's now running around. Uh, looking for a headset that's working and it stops ringing. And, uh, you know, I think she was then thinking, okay, that's it. They're probably looking for Doug Diamond's phone number or whoever is next, is next in line. And uh, then my cell phone began ringing and she finally got me conscious and uh, I answered my cell phone and uh, 
there was a very polite uh, woman with exactly the proper Swedish accent to convince you this is not a hoax call. And um, then there were some uh, some members of the committee who I knew personally that assured me, yes, this is the real thing. But uh, then the media start showing up in front of your house. So it's fortunate I live in an apartment building in Chicago and, and the university has a lot of experience with this. So they had people arriving at our apartment uh, within the hour to uh, deal with the world. But um, it's one, once in a lifetime and uh, it was uh, obviously gratifying. But we're probably the billionth people to uh, congratulate you, but congratulations on that. I think everyone now has also learned that if you want to do a Nobel Prize hoax on someone, you need a good friend with a Swedish accent. Um, <laughs> exactly. I, I, think that, I think there are very few people, uh, economists of this generation, uh, Richard, who could speak on everything from climate change to the vaccine to nudges to retail investors to alpha generation. Uh, so I'd like to thank you again for taking the time to spend this uh, moment with us at the conference. And uh, back, to, back to you, John. Thank you, Professor Thaler, Dr. Hyatt, and President Holloway for really that fascinating discussion. And Professor Thaler, we're all actually thrilled that you had your vaccine. We look forward to welcoming you to Rutgers someday, officially in person. So thanks everybody for joining us. We're gonna take a short intermission until 2.15 p.m. Eastern time. And then we'll transition to an interactive discussion with our participants. So thank you, and we'll see everybody at 2.15.